Cool. We are live. So, uh, hey, everyone, I hope you are doing very, very well. Um, happy Monday. Uh, sorry, first of all, for the delay. Uh, we're supposed to go live at 2 p.m., uh, but unfortunately, I live on a new estate and the entire estate uh, went dark. So we're here now. And, uh, you know, if you've got any questions as we go on, please do drop in the comments below. But I am joined by a phenomenal member of Shift Success today, and uh, she's going to be sharing her story of going from police officer to entrepreneur and uh, sharing the insights that she's learned along the way. So I want to get straight into it without any further ado. Catherine Thompson, how are you? Hello, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Actually, bizarrely, I've just had a massive burst of anxiety when you started to uh, do the intro. But no, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Um, so one of the first questions I'd like to ask uh, people on this webinar, uh, sorry, on this uh, podcast is to go right back to the beginning. And what was it like for you growing up as a kid? And where are you from? Uh, I'm from Scunthorpe. Uh, I was born in Scunny uh, General Hospital many, many a year ago. And I grew up in a little village um, about half an hour outside of, of Scunny. Um, I, I mean, it was all right. It was all right. It's, not, you know, nothing, nothing really awful, uh, nothing really amazing. It was just kind of fairly normal. Um, we, I was fairly kind of lucky. I've got an older sister, two years older than me. There's just the two of us. Um, I think we were fairly lucky when we were growing up. We always had a big house, uh, lots of holidays. My parents had, you know, new cars every every other year and stuff. So we kind of lived the dream on on paper, I suppose. Um, and the, yeah, it was just, it was just kind of, yeah, just normal. I just, it was easy. Things things were easy. It felt like. Awesome. Awesome. Was you, was you an academic? Was you a mischievous kid or was anything, you know, was your, was your older sister, the academic one, or was you the naughty one? Or was you both academic? Um, I think we're both probably the same in terms of, we just both found stuff easy. Um, school wasn't hard um, for either of us. We both played in sports teams and stuff and it didn't, I didn't have to put a lot of effort in to get good results um, basically, but it was kind of, it was kind of expensive expected that we would get good results my um my dad in particular was very um kind of strict and very uh furious if we ever didn't get sort of the grades that he he imagines that we should get and it was all it was all kind of about getting you know working hard enough to get to earn what you get and stuff he he was sort of mega hard working he um he was a, a chemical engineer um at BOC and he he literally built our house himself he built it on his rest days and, and weekends and stuff and he had his, his mates from work come and help him at the weekend so he he was the kind of guy that never stopped moving and never stopped working but part of the downside to that really was that he kind of expected the same of us so there was no kind of sitting about and even even now when people talk about the sort of stuff that was on tv when you're a kid i'm like no never saw any no don't know that don't know that because if you saw you sitting down you'll be given a job it was a real uh you know there's no relaxing until it's dark <laughs> wow. kind of mentality um but yeah gosh you know he built the house from the ground up which is pretty crazy um if you think about it it was really kind of uh, a lot but you know it, a lot of it was about control it was very controlling very very controlling and it started to become a problem as I grew older because you know as you're growing up you don't want to be controlled you don't mm. you don't want that kind of um atmosphere going on but yeah generally generally things were good my mum worked as well she was a, a midwife and then a health visitor um so yeah it was just generally it was all right fantastic awesome stuff awesome um did you go to like college or university or anything like that yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was it was one of those things that was a bit sort of preordained, really. It was never discussed. It was kind of, it was always going to happen that we did A-levels and then we, we both me and my sister went to university. Um, and kind of college, I the school I went to was a little village school. Um, it was very small and it was lovely. We all, it was just such a lovely time. And then A-levels were uh, at a college at this metropolis of Scunthorpe. I had to go into the town to do my A levels, um, and I had I bought my own car by that point, so I had a bit of freedom, and I went a bit crazy because um, I sort of thought I could 
glide my way through it um, the way that I had my GCSEs. But A levels are really hard. Nobody told you that. <laughs> you actually have to work, which I didn't at all. I was just bimbling about with my friends having a lovely time. So by the time I got my A level results, uh, they were awful. They were terrible. Um, I'd had provisional offers from University of Leicester and um, Liverpool. But, oh, God, they were terrible. And when we got the results, my dad was just like, whoa, you didn't work hard enough, you're not going anyway. It was a real, like, oh, God, my life's over kind yeah. of moment. Um, and we, we buggered off somewhere. I think we went I think we went to Edinburgh. It doesn't really matter. We went off somewhere, got back, and there were two answer phone messages um, for me, one from Liverpool, one from Leicester, saying, we know you haven't got your results, but don't go through clearing. You can still come. We still want you to come. Um, so I was like, "Yay, brilliant!" <laughs> My dad was like, "No, absolutely not. You, you're gonna, you're gonna do your A levels again. You've not earned this. You're gonna live at home." At that point, he found out that a friend that I spent a lot of time with was actually a girlfriend, which was a, another huge problem. Yeah. So um, yeah, he went ballistic. He wasn't, he wasn't having it. Deleted the messages off the answer phone, and that was the last I was to think of it. Um, so. The next time I went to, I had a little job. The next time I went to work, I um, used the office phone, rang up Leicester and said, can I still come? <laughs> um, got through to the person that I needed to speak to. And um, I just did it. I just thought, you know, you're not, no, you're not telling me what to do. Um, so yeah, big bust up, big fallout. So last time I spoke to my dad, uh, left like Dick Whittington. Half <laughs> 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 full of crap, not, not a handkerchief full of crap. Um, yeah, landed in Leicester, um, and I just haven't looked back, really. Uh, university was great fun. Um, thankfully, I joined the year before um, fees started happening. So the first thing I did when I got to Leicester was go and get a job, um, working behind a bar. And um, yeah, the next three years were a bit of a blur. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. What did you study at university? Uh, law. Law. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I wanted to be a lawyer since an early age. I saw this film, um, Legal Eagles. It's probably the worst film in the world, but my me and sister used to watch it again and again and again. I wanted to be Deborah Winger. She um, was a lawyer in the film. So uh, that was what I was going to be. Um, halfway through the degree, I just thought, this is so boring. Mm. It's so dry. And I was doing a little bit of sort of volunteering to get some experience as well. And it was all personal injury you know to people who fell over because they're not looking where they're going and wanting to sue somebody for it and then a little bit of criminal defense oh my god you know I wasn't gonna be Deborah Winger <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. okay so you're obviously you're halfway through university and you're kind of getting this oh you know this is not what it's cracked up to crack up to be do you carry on or do you make a pivot yeah yeah I carried on I didn't really know what else to do um you know the option was go back home which so it wasn't happening. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so yeah, yeah, I carried on, carried on. But I, I think it must have been about, about my third year. I decided that I wanted to actually do a job um, helping people, and I'd got into, I can't remember why, but I decided that I wanted to be um, a youth offending team officer, like a probation officer for young people. Mm. So I'd started volunteering. Um, doing intervention work with people who'd literally just started getting into trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, and I loved it. It was really good. It was really good fun. You really got to meet some good people who just made a few stupid decisions. Um, so that's the way I went. When I left uni, I got a job at the Leicester City Youth Offending Team. Mm. Um, and yeah, started working with young people. Um, and the most amazing team. It was so much fun. It was, it was just... It was just really good, really, really sort of opened my eyes to the world. And um, I had a blast, absolute blast. Oh, um, it was, uh, and I spent a lot of time in court. And I think that that's what, that's how it came to the end, really, for me, mm. because I just started to get really frustrated because a lot of the work that we were doing with young people was trying to get them to accept responsibility for their own actions and why they'd done stuff and, and then start to work on from that and then you'd go to court and they'd have some solicitor that wasn't Deborah Winger <laughs> just making excuses for them and just you know and you'd just be sitting there they're thinking oh my god mm. you, you know 
it, it just, I just felt so frustrated all the time after about five years. So um, that's kind of when I turned my eyes towards the police and thought, that looks like fun. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the team I was in, it was like a multi-agency team. There was a couple of police officers in the team and their stories were like, whoa. This Amazing. Sounds, this, yeah, it sounds like the next step. Okay. How old is you at this point when you think about, you know, obviously you've, so you've got this youth, um, this kind of youth job, you're kind of getting frustrated with, you know, hearing this listers and the lack of personal responsibility these guys have. You yeah. obviously get wrapped in kind of hearing about the stories that the police officers have. Um, how old are you at this period, period point in life? Um, about 27, I think. Oh, okay. I, yeah. By the time I started the application process, I was 27 and I was 28 when I joined. Um, Great. But and okay. it was it was kind of a similar thing really. I um you know got in first time, didn't find the any of the process difficult. Um, kind of glided through. I was the fourth cohort in Leicester to go through the university course. That was all sort of very new and stuff. And because a lot of it's legislation, it was easy peasy for me really. It was all it was just a bit of a reminder of stuff I'd done in my degree. So. Um, I, I beat everyone every time in all the legislation tests. <laughs> um, people were livid with me. People used to try and beat me, and I got 100% in one in one test, which was uh, wow, just a fluke because a lot of it was guess. But <laughs> do, do you feel like that success in itself was from your childhood? You know, hearing your dad say certain things about your performance. Um. Maybe, yeah, because I'd, I'd kind of gone a little bit off the handle um, through the college years and stuff. Um, and yeah, I, but I also, I also find it easy to learn. I'm one of those people that can just read something and it will stay with me. Um, but yeah, I mean, by this time, actually, my dad had died. I had, not um, oh. while I was at the defending team, he, um, oh God, he went, basically, he was a massive sort of control freak. And I think when I left and the the manner in which I left it kind of all came crumbling down for him and I think mm. in in part for me it's why you know when we're trying to trying to set goals for ourselves and people are like I want a big house I want all these cars I want holidays it you know what if you get that what if you've got that and actually you're still not happy where where is there to go what what can you look for next so mm. for him he basically just turned into a massive alcoholic wow um the only time I, I went home during the kind of university years, um, he was so pissed. He was so, so drunk, um, literally crawling to where he'd hidden his bottles and that he'd disappear and he'd hear clink, clink, thinking, oh God, wow. <laughs> it. it's quite obvious what's going on. So yeah, he, um, he fell over, hit his head, died about three days later when I was about 24, um, mm. which was a shock, but... I hadn't had a relationship with him since since leaving so it was another thing to kind of think oh god there's yeah. no reason not to go back there yeah okay um but so you're part of the so you've joined the police now you, you're obviously in the police um what kind of um jobs did you go in straight away was you obviously response cop but did you go into any other areas straight away or anything like that um, yeah, well, yeah, straight away uniform, uh, doing response um, for about a year. It's the first year or so. I think the first six months we were at university and then we got unleashed on the world. Um, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I'm just watching my cat last time I was on a Zoom. <laughs> um, yeah, God, it was brilliant. It was a small station in a pretty rough part of Leicester, to be fair. Um, but the team was amazing. The, the, our sergeants were amazing. The DI was amazing um loved every minute of it um and after i'd been there about a year i got offered the chance to go on the uh it was called the nat team neighborhood action team basically doing drug warrants and um you know all that sort of stuff plain clothes just running about causing havoc um and that was quite good fun it was a little bit more unstructured but i quite i quite liked it um being a bit roughy tufty as well you know it was just a kind of group of four of us so we just go around and annoy people really <laughs> um, and it was when I was on that team I did the uh, method of entry training you know the big red key mm. um, and at Leicester at the time they had a, a, a rig built out of scaffolding and the last thing they would do is, as a bit of fun um, on the training is you had to climb over the scaffold thing as if you as if you're going to um go into like a first floor flat 
and you have to pass the, the big red key to each other and you know help each other up and down and stuff um and I was at the top of that scaffolding wearing somebody else's PSU stuff because I didn't have any somebody else's gloves and somebody else's helmet and it was the hottest day of the year as well it was like yeah. first of June it was yeah. aching and I was on the top holding on and then my hands started to slip out of the gloves <laughs> and I was like oh god like <laughs> watching it happen because my hands were so sweaty in these massive gloves and basically I fell fell off the top, landed uh, badly on my back and broke oh. two vertebrae on my back. Um, oh God. L1 and T12 uh, for detail. Wow. Plans. <laughs> so that was pretty scary. That was that was weird. Um, I still remember vividly the whole thing. Um, not being able to sort of feel anything. And the ambulance guys were like t- saying, can you, can you feel this touching, you know, doing something to my foot? And I was like, I've got boots on. <laughs> Of course I can't feel it, but they'd taken my boots off. That you know, it was all a bit like, oh god. Um, but it was it was it ended up being okay. It was there were there were stable fractures and it took a while to sort of be able to walk again properly. And um I was off work for about three months. I, in fact I went back to work after three months. How ridiculous is that? Why didn't wow. you know? But I was so keen, yeah, so desperate to get back. Um but once once I did get back, I was on restricted duties for about three months. And then the um, LPU commander wanted to hide me away because he was scared I was going to get injured again. Um, and I was still really, you know, I couldn't I couldn't particularly move my feet independently of the others. So I couldn't drive because I couldn't brake properly. Um, so he put me in a CID placement for six months. And that's, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. The, the DS was amazing. Um, the team were just, you know, all really gelled. You know, we'd have, we'd have pretty impressive jobs, pretty exciting jobs, pretty, you know, horrible people that would get locked up. And I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Um, and did, did quite well. Um, you know, she kept me on a little bit longer than, than should have done. I bounced back to uniform for about four months and then I was taken back into CID um, to have a temp, be in a temporary D, um, DC role, which lasted about another year and a half. So it was brilliant. The best fun of my policing career was in those first sort of six or seven years. It was brilliant. I, I couldn't wait for rest days to be over. And I went wow. to bed early wanting to just get rid of the night so I could get up and get to work the next day. It really was. Um, That's ev- amazing. Yeah, it was crazy. Looking back now, I just think, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's amazing. I think it really is. I think, um, you yeah, know, it's really great to hear, actually. So, so what, what changed for you then? What? Because obviously we'll go into your story and business and your success there in a second. But why did you even start thinking about going alone in business? Um, it kind of changed when I um, I moved from the unit I was in, which was kind of a core crime CID unit, and I had amazing sort of supervisors. The DI and the team was absolutely wonderful, really supportive. I then changed and went to the domestic abuse unit, um, and it was from the start. It was um, it, the team was the t- team were brilliant the team of dcs were absolutely brilliant knew their stuff backwards but it's quite a risky job it's all about you know if somebody ends up dead you're you're in part responsible if you haven't you know put the things in place to protect them and it was really clear from the start there were two ds's and a di and nobody liked them nobody respected them they were just awful um and they worked they all worked monday to friday eight till four so they weren't even there for most of the time um so it kind of changed and and it was that kind of atmosphere working under that kind of you know everyone kind of whispering about them and being sort of it felt like we were picked off one one by one at times um for for various little things um but the thing the thing that kind of broke how i saw the police is so is so so silly um we call it sandalgate or did call it sandalgate um, this guy that I worked with a lot, he, um, he was close to retirement and he just didn't care what anyone said. He was just going to, you know, come in and do his job and then go home. He came in wearing these awful sandals um, one day, like Jesus sandals, absolutely hideous. 
Mm. <laughs> Barry, he'd, he'd like worn them years for years when he was in the child abuse unit. So, you know, he wore them every summer. Um, and we went out one day, we were going, I'd been given a job to go and check up on this, this woman. Um, we went out and I got a phone call uh, from the car saying, are you, are you with Ian? Is he wearing his sandals still? I like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she said, um, the sergeant said, right, you're not to go to that address with him in his sandals. So, all right, yeah, fine, fine, whatever. Um, so I told him and we were just like, right, let's not go back till four o'clock because they're really annoying. They'll have buggered off by four. Um, and we were on a late shift. So we went to social services to um, you know have a bit of a chit chat with them about the, the address we were going to. And when we got there, the social worker was actually there and she was like, well, you, you and me, let's go to the address. He can stay here in his sandals and read through the paperwork. Anyway, long story short, that's what happened. The next day when we got to work, all hell had broken loose because both the DSs and the DI had just been watching on the GPS where where our car went. So they'd seen us go to social services and then they'd seen us go to the address. So they thought we disobeyed <laughs> this ruling about uh, Ian going in his bloody sandals. Um, and that is just, it's, it's as silly as that, but the idea that I was out there kind of doing my job and there's two people, one rank above me and, and another two ranks above me, literally that, that was their afternoon watching where our car went and deciding what they were going to do about it. And I just thought, oh, God, I can't. I'm not doing this. <laughs> um, it coincided with a lot of things. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I was married at that time. I decided that it, was, it wasn't working. I didn't want to be in that relationship anymore. It got you know, too controlling, too, too sort of negative. Um, my auntie had cancer, so she was, I was back and forth to Scunthorpe, um, visiting her, which was sort of bringing up all kinds of issues. Um, and then my sister's husband at the time, they lived in London, he had started having treatment for bone marrow failure. Um, so we had to have a bone marrow transplant. So there was all this stuff going all over the place. And then at work, I was just like, oh God, I, just, I cannot work for you people. This is horrendous. Um, so that, that really was the start of the, the end, I suppose. Um, okay. I'm not good with frustration. So the more I felt frustrated, the, the worse I felt. Mm -hmm. So it, that kind of precipitated my first big period of depression. Um, proper, not leaving the house, just massively anxious, not able to think straight. Um, which is pretty horrendous because I, I kind of do live in my head quite a lot. So um, for my head to not work was, was a scary old thing. Um, and it just, it just kind of went on from there. It never got better from there. Um, I suppose like a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So um, at this point you're thinking, Oh, I don't know if I can work here anymore. You know, what's your next step? Do you hand in your notice straight away? Do you build a business along the side of that or would you take career break what, what happens um I, I kind of I, I persevered because by the time I'd come back from work and then I had a period of restriction while I built up my hours and stuff again I then started to think I need to get another job I need to do something else but who's going to have me with this awful sick record now I've, I've had this massive period of sickness so I need to just work a couple of years until that effectively drops off um and at the time I'd started seeing somebody um who had a little plants business um she grew and sold um like veggie plants and some flowers and stuff just as a hobby but she had quite a few sort of customers so i'd kind of worked with her a bit and was like you could you could make a lot of money out of this you've got a lot of regular customers why don't you start changing it up a bit so we did a lot of stuff um and we went to a lot of places with with these plants um and improved her business kind of like 10 times over in terms of profitability um and while we were doing that we were at this food and drink um thing um selling plants next to a guy that owns a vineyard about three villages away from where i live and i never even knew it was there so um got really got chatting to him and arranged to go and have a look around the vines and stuff and then he asked me if i'd 
start running vineyard tours uh, if I'd sort of learn a bit of the process and start doing that. So that was my first kind of thing on my own. Um, and it was brilliant. We sort of started from nothing, um, literally just advertising on Facebook. Um, and by the end, it was, we had, we did like adult Easter egg hunts where I'd hide bottles of gin and stuff around the- <laughs> Amazing. Around the and a sign up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, nothing for kids. It was all adults. Um, we did like a 5K and a 10K run, a charity, couple of charity events a year. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, so I started to really see that I could make money as a sideline and then drop my hours, which which was my plan. Um, and it kind of, around this time, that's when I became aware of the franchise business that I bought into, which was uh, an events business. Um and it was actually my my brother-in-law, um, Adam, was in hospital again. He was in intensive care. And his best friend's wife was also a franchisee. So we kind of got chatting about the business and the, the possibilities and stuff. So I decided I was gonna I was gonna go ahead and do that as well. Um, so it was all it was going quite well. It was going quite well. Um, but Leicester have this, Leicester police have this method of just changing their operating system every every couple of years so you never you're never in one place very long um and it, it kind of is a way to hide the fact that they haven't got enough staff you know, you know the cuts the cuts have been felt everywhere um but and it certainly was pretty bad in leicester um so actually things were, at work were going from bad to worse i'd gone back to a cid unit um but at one point, my shift was supposed to be eight people. I was the only one. Um, I was the only one. There wasn't anybody else. So it was kind of I was just being battered, battered, left, right and centre for work. And you couldn't do a good job, you know, when you haven't got the time, you haven't got any colleagues. <laughs> um, you, you just can't get anything done. And that, it became more about, you know, you'd get into trouble for not filling in this 28 day, have you updated your victims thing? but there's nothing to update the victims with because you haven't had time in the last 28 days to do anything. So you're just updating them that you've not done anything. Um, and, and just those ticky boxes just seem more important than actually resolving any of the issues that, that were sort of bubbling, bubbling up. So it kind of, I had dropped my hours, but what they did was give everyone laptops, which meant while I wasn't physically at work, I was sitting here, on, on my police laptop trying to trying to get work done so again I, I had another sort of episode um of depression which this one was was the worst by far it was it went so deep um I was off for six months um god it was it was really bad I needed a lot of support to, to kind of clamber back out of it um I mean I'm still I'm still open to secondary mental health services at the minute but kind of hoping that I'll get discharged <laughs> at some point I think it's only because COVID I haven't been able to go in and, and tell them that things are going well but oh god it was it, and it I was told at that point by a psychiatrist it's work it's all work if you don't leave that place you'll never be well again so I kind of I kind of thought that's a bit much. That's uh, that's a bit of a scary thing to be told, um, and didn't really believe it. I just thought, well, you don't know me. <laughs> this is, you know, we've sat opposite each other for a couple of hours. You don't. Maybe that's not the thing. But I did decide at that point. I'm. I need to. I do actually need to do something um, so that I can at least drop to half time. Maybe at work. Maybe that won't be so bad. Um, so that was my plan. I. Um, I bought into the, the franchise. I carried on um, with the plans for the vineyard tours and, and the, the plants as well, even though I, I split up with the person I was seeing, I thought oh, I can do this as well, because I really enjoyed it. Um, and it kind of it kind of all came to a head again um, when my brother-in-law Adam died um, in December of 2019. Um, he'd given it a good go. He'd had three bone marrow transplants and um, you know, in the end, uh, it came and got him. So I went, we we had his funeral on Christmas Eve. Um, my sister just wanted it done. She didn't want him on ice over Christmas and New Year and stuff. So 
as soon as we'd had the funeral, we buggered off to Dubai because um, she didn't want any Christmas, any any celebrating of New Year. So off we went. And um, we just decided there that life's too short. Life is far, far too short. Um, they're both, or well, they were both in the Met. So they, you know, we'd had lots of conversations about getting out and what we do and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, sat on a very, very warm uh, hotel roof in Dubai. <laughs> over new year and thought yeah i'm not going back i'm not going back to that place um can't do it i just kind of bundled up maybe two three months worth of money um and i just thought i I had so many bookings for the events business i thought i can do the plants the vineyard is amazing i can make a lot of money off off events there so yeah i'm doing it absolutely doing it so absolute inspiration Oh, it was, yeah, it was, I just thought I can't, I cannot work for those people and I'm not working. I'm ticking boxes. It's, uh, what's the point? What's the point? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was, I was absolutely thrilled to bits, got back. Um, and I spoke to a guy, a friend of mine, a wonderful guy, uh, who's a fed rep. Um, cause I had a complaint running a, the mother of a guy who'd kicked somebody unconscious and broke his jaw, made a complaint about me that her son had been charged. <laughs> like, how about he didn't kick somebody unconscious in front of a load of witnesses, then he wouldn't have got charged. But that, that was going, that was kind of running. Um, so I phoned my friend in the Fed and said, I want to quit. Um, you know, how can we, how can we manage this with the complaint that's running? I don't want it to seem like I've quit because of that Um, because I didn't do anything wrong he did Um, and he sort of said do you know what you know you're not thinking straight Uh, you've been you've been unwell before you're not you know all this has happened with Adam you're not thinking straight how about you go sick for a bit and I just thought all right yeah fair enough so I did I reported sick Uh, did it for a month and then just thought no, because it's still hanging over me. Mm. I've still got phone calls from work. How are you doing? Oh, I was fine until I answered the phone to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, cut the strings and thought and everything, you know, it was such a relief. It was amazing. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, and I felt so secure with the plans that I had and the bookings that I had that I buggered off to um, Cape Verde in March as a little, I've quit. Uh, holiday and we arrived back literally the day before lockdown (laughs) um obviously that happened all the events got cancelled um and I was a bit just like oh god this is uh this is a bit crap let's uh, Uh, let's let's go let's go back because you've obviously had this change of heart about the police you've had a you know an enlightenment almost an inspiration sadly of your brother-in-law's death and obviously there's other things that have happened in your life and before you actually decide to leave the job, you go into a franchise, right? Mm. And talk to me about, and for the listeners, you know, what is that franchise and uh, what made you go into a franchise? Um, well, it's called Detective Project. Um, and it basically is events based around um, a crime scene. So you turn up in person, you throw a, a, a fake body down on the floor, a load of evidence around it, and then tape it off. And the participants um, just come and examine the crime scene and then you do a little investigation sort of thing. So it's kind of good for t- team building. Um, I did a lot of school workshops. Um, and there's also like a, a, an arm of the business that's children's birthday parties, but I wasn't keen on doing them. So I used to price myself um just a bit too high because <laughs> that the, the noise level is just uh unbearable um and i i went into it i think because i knew it was a way of leaving the police that was my plan i was going to leave the police or at least drop right down and i still wanted to be part of a team i wanted to i wanted to go along a, a sort of a, a path that had already been created i suppose um i didn't want to have to fight my own way because didn't feel like I'd know even where to start. So, and it's all uh, former or still serving um, detectives as well. Um, so there was kind of, um, you know, almost like a family group away from the police, but uh, with the same sort of mentality. I'm in interest. Mm, yeah, yeah. So it seemed, it seemed sensible. It was 
certainly the Essex team um, have made you know a really good kind of um, salary for themselves by doing it, and they still work part time with the Met. But you know, it was the the figures that they were coming up with were pretty inspiring. So I just thought, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Sounds really okay. good. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so you've gone into franchise, um, basically just support, camaraderie, uh, just so you'd have to go alone, essentially. And also it's a way out for you to leave the police because you know, kind of in your head, my time's up in the police, this is going to help me get out. Um, obviously, COVID hits and events kind of stop. Ah, um, What happens then? What what do you do then in, as a result of COVID stopping the, the franchise business? Um, I, after the initial panic, there was a few days of just oh my god um but I'd already because I decided to quit um the police sort of so early in the year basically in the year I'd already sown loads of seeds for for veggies and, and plants and stuff and I had them all over the windowsills in my house <laughs> so that I could you know nurture them there wasn't going to be any sort of issue of frost so I had all that and I found a company that um deliver basically plug plants little baby plants and you order based on what week of the year the plants will be ready and they deliver them out so as soon as we got back and um heard about lockdown i um i phoned up the company the next day and was like you still are you still delivering and they're like yeah yeah yeah, it's work we're allowed to work so i immediately ordered thousands thousands of the bloody things um whatever they had in stock i was ordering because they the garden centres all closed. So the woman was saying that had a lot of cancellations. They were going to have a lot of waste. So I was like, I love them. I love them. Yep. 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 Bring them to me. So I had, um, I had a lorry arrive and there, there were pallets and pallets <laughs> of these bloody plug plants. Um, but I was just potting them up and growing them on. Um, and as lockdown kind of went on, um, I started doing, it was like a, a bit of an experiment really, but I joined up with some boys that sold fruit and veg um, and they were selling, they set up a stall in a pub car park because it was outdoors, um, you know, people could come along and, and just buy their fruit and veg. So I set up a plant store next to them um, and it just, it went crazy. It was absolutely crazy because it was such a good summer. All the garden centres were closed. I was pretty much, um, one of the only people that could sort of deliver plants to people so I was doing oh my god I was working sort of 16 hours a day setting up you know doing a stall then doing deliveries then coming back and carrying on with the plants that needed attention in the garden and stuff um it was crazy it was brilliant um I just I made so much money <laughs> um selling them all that I kind of thought to myself it's going to be fine it's going to be absolutely fine because I've now got this this lump of cash take away a bit that's going to have to be paid off in tax and whatnot but I'd worked out if I could really eke my outgoings to about 10 pounds a week then this the cash that I had would pay all my bills through to I think June the following year mm. um so yeah it was brilliant I, I had a lovely time I know lockdown was really tough for a lot of people but I had a lovely time. <laughs> you adapted by the sounds of it, which is which is really good to hear. Um, okay, so you've obviously got the franchise stuff. Events has kind of paused for now, but then you've gone into selling um, essentially these these plant products, right? These, these in, in, in green fingers almost. Um, with that, literally, right, money and green. Um, but with with regards to the um, e, the events kind of sort of franchise stuff, what kind of lessons did you learn from that? Because you're not doing that anymore. Um, and you've actually got an amazing business and product that we will go on to soon. Uh, it's going very, very well. But what kind of lessons did you learn from the franchise world? For anyone listening, thinking about getting into franchises, because for those who don't listen, essentially, if a franchise helps you set up a business, but essentially you've got to pay them a commission, an upfront fee, essentially, sometimes as well. Um, and there's a lack of control in a, in a lot of areas. Um, Catherine, what did you learn through your experience? Um. Well, I, it's difficult to say because it kind of went spectacularly wrong um, at the end of last year. But I guess the thing is, um, you know, I the reason I joined a franchise was, um, you know, the team, the team sort of support, really. Um, I didn't want to feel like I'd gone, gone on my own and, you know, I wanted the expertise, I suppose. 
So we had these fortnightly Zoom meetings with the team. Um, often there'd only be one or two of the others because, like I say, they were still working in the police, most of them. And it would basically be the, the kind of business owner, like with a head in a hand saying, don't worry, events will come back soon. There was no plan B. It was kind of carry on with what you're doing. Um, and certainly um, one of the other franchisees had been thinking about ditching her job as well and going full time. So she was just, oh, thank God I didn't do that. And it was just all about, let's just, let's just wait and see what happens next. There was no kind of forward thinking or, and I started to think, oh God, you know, I've kind of invested quite a lot of money and yeah, it was a 10% sort of commission thinking, thank God I've got the plants. Thank God I had a, a I don't want a side hustle from my side hustle. <laughs> yeah. It was, but you know, thank God I had that because otherwise, you know, I would have had to, I would have had to go to the bank of mom, which it's, it's more hassle than it's worth. Mm. Um, I knew it was going to be all right because she would help me out if I needed it. But, at the same time you know at what cost <laughs> does yep. that come so um yeah i just started to think oh god you know and when events do come back and what form are they there's, there's not even any forward planning for um you know what is going to happen what is going to happen when the world reopens so okay. i'd started writing a um an online scenario that we could sort of maybe do and act out and stuff like that but um it was just, I just couldn't fit it in with all the work that I was doing with the plants. There was, you know, I only had so many hours in the day. And certainly when I sat down, it was with a drink. So <laughs> it was only, it was only a couple of hours after that point. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So, so the, fr the franchise, you've kind of said, you know, you felt like there's no contingency almost like events have been stopped. You've, you're expecting this kind of plan to come forward from the franchise e the franchise owner who's who's actually gave you the franchise and there's no plan and you're like well you know what do we do right so you start to get busy you go into selling your uh, your plants and stuff like that um and um yeah you start producing money what happens in this process does this the period with the board game starts to be developed yeah it kind of it kind of, I'd, I'd started wearing a, I'd, I'd had a couple of t-shirts printed with the name of the events business so that I could start talking to people about when the world opens up, look, we'll do these events and stuff. So that started conversations about um, people's interest in, in true crime and, you know, what tele programs they watched and all that sort of stuff. But it, it really kind of came into an idea that I was going to progress when, um the plant business came to sort of a natural halt in September because that's you know you, you're starting to look towards the winter then um so and it was when you know all the eat out to help out and the world had opened up again so I buggered off to Turkey for a couple of weeks um so I didn't do actually I didn't do badly out of holidays for for last year when everyone else was locked down but I went to just literally sit with my toes in the sand and do nothing because I was absolutely exhausted um and I'd, I'd got a free copy of your book um, sent out to me. So I read it while I was there and I'd, I'd started thinking again about an idea that I had when I was at university when um, the OJ Simpson trial was on uh, and everyone was glued to the TV. It was the first, it was the first big thing like that, certainly I'd ever seen. And it was, it was fascinating, really interesting. And I started to think about, um, wouldn't it be interesting to, to have a, a pack of documents that the jury are getting and basically go through it at home on your own. Um, and that was back at uni and, you know, it was kind of the, the internet was in its infancy and it's, you know, getting hold of that information was impossible to me. So I kind of put it to bed and I'd started to think about it again um, while I was selling plants and while I was chatting to people and, you know, everyone was, everyone was getting hooked on the latest Netflix things and it was all crime apart from the typing it was all crime type stuff and I was thinking oh yeah god people are still dead interested in this um so I did a bit of market research and I actually I found two companies that were already doing it one a German company and one an American company and I thought oh, that's that then I'm, the idea's already been done um so I went on holiday read your book and that particular chapter that says um don't be put off if someone else is doing your idea uh, it just means there's a market and I thought oh yeah there is 
Um, so that's that is absolutely what triggered me thinking about it again. So came back from holiday, sat about for a, a week or two, sort of just chilling, and then literally started writing it. It took me um, the best part of a month to 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 write the story and to sort of get the detail in. Um, and at that point, I started to think, actually, this is this even even though it's something I've created, this is quite good, and people are probably hopefully going to like this. So. I took it to our fortnightly Zoom meetings. I sent um, all the franchisees a copy and I said, I've, you know, I've had this idea. I, I think looking at the two other companies that are doing it, they, they've made a success of it and they've you know, been able to scale it and, and make a living from it. So how about we all write one? We launch them you know, one after the other so that we immediately take over the market, the UK market. Um, stamp our authority on it and it can be something that actually we have adverts inside for our events um, so the franchise owner was a bit like mm, it's not really the way I want the business to go we're about events not about you know play at home products we want people to come out and and, and do an event so I was um I said at one point actually to to one of the other franchisees, if she says that one more time, I'm not even going to discuss it with her again. I'm just going to set up my own company and, and go on my own. So it was kind of like that. It was basically, yeah, you 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 go off and and you 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 do all the work and come back to us and let us know how it's gone. So that's what I did. Um, launched it, branded it with Detective Project because I wanted it to kind of feed my own business um when events did start to happen again and quickly i mean in the first month in the first week of launching i sold out of what i'd made here so it was it went crazy from day one the first month i think i had about four thousand pounds in sales and that's mainly because i just couldn't make them fast enough i had one printer by December, I had three printers. You can't imagine the noise of three printers all at one time. If I never hear it again, <laughs> it will be too soon. But, um, you know, it was kind of, it was locked down anyway. So it wasn't like I could have anyone come and help me. Um, at which point, you know, I was, I was sharing the news of the sales and how amazing it was with the group. And um, that's when the, the franchisor who hadn't liked the idea in the first place said, you know, you need to give me 10% um, gross profit. And I was even, just- Even like, though you created it, even though it's your idea. Yeah, yeah. Even right. though I was kind of working it's 15, 16 hours a, a day again, um, you know, building these boxes and packing them and, and all that sort of stuff. So it kind of, it came to a head a little bit because I said, no, 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 I'm willing to, I'm willing to pay something for the use of the branding, but no, 10% is just unreasonable. Um, so it came to head and unfortunately, you know, she kind of threatened it's 10 percent or you're out of the franchise, which, you know, I'm not I'm not one. I'm not I don't like threats, really. I don't suppose anyone does, but I'm probably a bit too stubborn for my own good because I just think, no, you're not. Don't threaten me. Mm. It's not happening. So, I just, yeah, I left. I said, fine, absolutely not a problem at all. You you go your way. I'll I'll go my way. Um and uh, set up the new company. So the new company is called uh, Cold Case Investigation Unit. Um, and yeah, just went from there. So December was a £10,000 month. Um, I launched game two. I wrote another game, I launched game two, kind of early mid-January, something like that. And it's, um, it has grown legs and it is sprinting. <laughs> it's amazing. I've just passed fifty thousand pounds in sales. Um, wow! Absolutely incredible. It's wild. It is. Um, yeah, it's kind of bizarre. Absolutely incredible. Well, let's go back to those first that first four thousand. So you've created this idea from your mind, and I think it's amazing that you've done that. Uh, you launch, you put it out there to the marketplace, and these sales start coming in. How mm. do you what? tell me the emotions that's going through your head um disbelief really disbelief because a lot of the a lot of the time my last kind of days and weeks and months in the police had been you know quite quite sort of low and um I was getting into arguments with people and and with my supervisors and I kept being told you know you're being paranoid you've been paranoid this isn't happening that's not happening um, so I started to really doubt my own mind and, and how I, the, my thought processes and stuff. So 
when I kind of created the the game, it was very sort of personal and a bit kind of raw, really. And I, I was a bit scared sending it out because I was thinking, oh, God, what if people don't like it? What if now now random strangers are going to be telling me that I'm crazy and paranoid and, you know, all these sorts of things. So I would kind of look at the numbers. I'd sort of click to see what the shop was doing a couple of times a day. And I just... It would just, you know, you know, when you sort of feel like your heart's lifted a bit when you see more sales and I'll be like, oh, my God. And then immediately like, oh, my God, what if they hate it? What if, you know, yeah. what? <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> um, and as it, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I used to send screenshots all the time to my sister saying, oh, my God, look at this, look at this, look at this. As soon as she started asking um, for money for a new roof, I stopped doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Just a bit of overtime. She's still in the Met. <laughs> She's still got a salary. Amazing. <laughs> um, but it was it was such an anxious first month because obviously there's a time lag before you get the first reviews. And then, I mean, even now when I see there's a new review on Amazon, I'm a bit like, ooh, mm. until I see, oh, yeah, it's all right. It's another five-star one. <laughs> yeah. um, and I don't know at what point I'll feel confident about it. But, yeah, it's still a bit... I still care a bit too much. Um, it's your creation. It's your, it's, your, it's your baby, right? It's your business baby, essentially. So you're going to yeah. care. So you've got, you've got these sales coming through. It's amazing. You hit £4,000 in your first month. Second month, it scales to, I think, £10,000. And then it keeps yeah. scaling from there. And you're four, four months on now? Um, it's about November, December, January, February, March, five months. Five months, you're 53,000 and it's still growing, which is amazing. Um, you've launched number two as well, the second version of your products. You've obviously got a new company now. Your reviews are phenomenal. I've checked them out as well. Um, what do you, how do you, how do you, how do you feel? Like, I know you think you're 4,000 pounds, we talked about that, but how do you feel now? Is do you feel excited about the future? Do you feel nervous do you feel anxious do you feel like yeah. you've made it well how do you feel a bit of all of those really I guess I mean I, I've got a bit of anxiety about you know what if what if it all ends tomorrow mm. but then I kind of over the last week or so I've started to think well I'll just do something else I, I can figure it out um you know that's what I've been doing since I left the police is is figuring it out so actually if it was if it you know nobody buys another game after tomorrow it will be all right. I'll just do something else. Um, and it, it is giving me a lot more kind of confidence. The fact that people love game two as well. So it's not just a, a one-off kind of fluke. Fluke, yeah. Um, it's, it's quite nice seeing, um, you know, game one sales are still amazing, but game two is starting to grow legs as well. So I think that must be game one players coming back and, and wanting to, you know, wanting to have more. And I get a lot of people emailing me and messaging me and you know sort of privately saying how amazing a night they had and even they had it was something a bit different it, it got their it got them talking and chatting and debating as a family rather than literally just sitting watching the telly um let me just pause you there let me just pause you there so, so and this is i want everyone to listen to this so um my my ears pricked up so i was thinking you know what problems are you solving you're an entrepreneur you've created this product you've launched into the marketplace you're going very very well and what I'm hearing there is that you're not selling a game. You're selling family time. You're selling togetherness. You're selling the ability to connect and deeper foster relationships rather than playing on Netflix or going on the phones. Am yeah. I right in saying that? That's what I got from that. Yeah, gosh, definitely. Some, I mean, it's been a bit overwhelming. Some of the sort of feedback that, that says exactly that, you know, the people that have started now having like a weekly games night and and just and and having that kind of feeling of achieving something as well one, one woman said that she's always wanted to be a detective but she never felt clever enough uh, and now she feels that she kind of is and can because she's she's played my game and got it right but yeah definitely I mean it's all it's all date night um couples that just wanted something different to do families that are that sort of played together and yeah kind of just had a really good um evening just doing something a bit different um and not a game like monopoly that generally ends up being thrown in the air and everyone having a drop it's <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those people <laughs> <laughs> so, Amazing. So yeah, 
amazing. And and how do you how do you get your game to market? Do you, do you sell it on your website or anything else? Um, I'm about to um, launch my website. It's being created for me, and it should be ready to go in a couple of weeks. And there will be a shop on there. Um, the biggest place I sell it is Amazon. Um, they sell hundreds and hundreds a week. Uh, game one and game two. I'm also I've got a little shop set up through my Facebook page um, that it can be bought direct um, from there as well. So yeah, a couple of couple of oh yeah, an escape room. Oh god, I can't remember the name. Of it. An escape room company that sell um, those games contacted me and bought a, a, a quantity wholesale, and they're going quite well on there. Wow, absolutely amazing! So you're creating partnerships due to the success of your game. People, are, other companies, bigger companies, reaching out to you and asking to sell your products to their customers. Yeah, which is nice. <laughs> Pretty nice. Pretty amazing. Um, so this is this is amazing. You know, success story. You're not unhappy in in the police. You've made those changes. You've put hard work in, um, long hours, and you've made it work through one of the most, you know, catastrophic times in human history, the global pandemic. Um, what have been some, because we've heard all this success and you're making great money, you, you know, doing what you love, but what are some of the challenges that you faced with either creating this business or, or product or, or maybe scaling it? Um, well, the, the fallout with the, the franchise was a bit um, not necessarily upsetting, but it was kind of, you know, once I'd left the police, I thought I'm never, I'm never going to be sort of treated like that again you know when you when you when you're of a pc or dc level basically everybody's telling you what to do and you just have to do it so you know the fact that i could then a year or however long it was later be you know issued an ultimatum or you know someone try and sort of push me around in the same way that was a bit like oh this isn't this isn't what i expected um challenge wise it it literally kind of has been a case of just being able to to make it fast enough and to to produce it um, fast enough and, and learning, teaching myself how to, how to advertise and, and all that sort of stuff. I'd already kind of been a bit self-taught with Facebook ads and all that sort of stuff with the vineyard um, work that I did. And that was really starting to take off um, as well in popularity. But mainly, I think, you know, being being on your own with it, it's it is amazing um and to have these sort of successes and and the, the sales is absolutely fantastic you know and i tell my dogs about it all the time but <laughs> generally it's kind of and, and with it being you know locked down as well it's hard to it's hard to kind of share other than a phone call oh my god you won't believe how much money i've just made it's difficult not to be a bit braggy when everyone else is having such an awful time whereas you know i'm dancing like a little pixie on all my gold yeah, well, here's the thing, you know, it, it's, you know, you've got to celebrate the wins, you've got to reward success. Everyone has the same opportunity, have the same 24 hours in a day, and um, you've made it work. And I think that needs to be celebrated because by the sounds of it, you've not had an easy life growing up and going through the stress of the job and other things. Um, so yeah, you know, hats off to you for the success that you've gained. I think it's phenomenal. What kind of um, skill sets do you believe that you transferred from the police into your own business? Um, organization without a doubt. Um, certainly in the early days when I was putting, putting all these documents into the boxes, it reminded me of building the paper remand files when you had to do that, um, before it all went electronic. Mm. And that was one of my favorite jobs. Um, you know, after a long, long day and you'd got someone horrible locked up, I loved, um, you know, building my little piles of paper. So the organization and now I've outsourced a lot of the printing and a lot of the bits and bobs, you know, managing all of those things arriving at the same time and, and all that sort of thing. Um, and probably communication to a large degree. I think, you know, I can pretty much talk my way into or out of anything, which I found in the police. And it's, you know, it helps now um, being able to, you know, talk about it and, and just produce something that is, just various forms of communication for people to, to flick through. I think those are the main ones. Amazing. Not resilient, I'm not very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds like you are. Um, <laughs> absolutely phenomenal. Okay, and obviously you've been with a Shift Success for about, I think about four months now. When do you join? December, November? December, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Um, and what kind of what kind of some mindset differences have you experienced as a result of having support? You know, you've obviously been in the franchise, which is very different to what we do at Shift Success. So what kind of differences have you felt there? Um, immediate kind of, it's, it's an immediate difference. I think um, both being in the police and being in the franchise, it, it kind of occurred to me that you're there to make somebody else look good. You're there to earn money for them, basically. Um, certainly so with the franchise. You're kind of, when you have a success, it's somebody else rubbing their hands together because it's it's money or you know um, more sort of praise for them. Mm. Um, and I do. I kind of well, like with the police and actually with the franchise. First of all, I jump into things with both feet, and I did. I fall in love with the whole process and. Uh, everyone involved in it and and then it's why probably why I get so terribly hurt and periods of depression when it doesn't work out so when I came to shifts to success I was a bit sort of battered and bruised by you know that whole process and actually it was on it was still ongoing and I didn't I didn't d discuss that with anyone I didn't sort of bring it to the group because I kind of thought I don't want to be like I'm here I fall out with everyone <laughs> um which is kind of how it felt and it it was kind of weird because I think I because I kind of give everything and um you know to the point where there's there's nothing left it, it quickly became sort of obvious that you know being part of the group and seeing the other conversations and I'd put a few bits and bobs into the Facebook group and suddenly I was getting a lot more and still am getting a lot more than I was giving um and I'm not being asked to give anything either I think um a massive thing has been the master, the um, accountability um, thing, you know, being able to, you know, when I talk to my friends and say, oh my God, I'm just, I'm so, so tired. And my hands are ripped to shreds from doing these boxes. My friends are just like, oh, poor sausage. Oh, I'm, I'm earning so much money, poor me. Whereas, you know, in the accountability thing, I was like, right, oh my God. And it's still, you know, doing work while I was on the thing. And immediately people are like, right, do this, do this, do this, do this. It'll, it'll all be so much easier for you. And I've done all of those things. And it is, <laughs> you know, nobody's saying anything because there's something in it for them. It's literally, I've got some experience with this here. This is what you need to do. Um, and there's no backlash. There's no, I've, I've just done you a favour, you know, now you need to, to do this for me. Mm. So that, for me, it kind of, it's oh I don't want to say life changing because that's a bit cheesy but it's really affected my kind of mindset and I'm less paranoid less oh don't you know get away from me because you're just going to want something now I'm just like if I've got an issue I know that there's a, a team of 100 plus people probably half of which are actually going to know the answer and they're going to share the answer without being dicks <laughs> um so it, kind of, it, it feels like anything's possible. I mean, um, game three is, has been an idea in my head for quite some time now. Um, and I wanted, in my wildest dreams, to create video footage uh, as, as an evidential source. And, you know, as part of the group now, I've got um, Darren um, Ockenden's coming down next week um, to film game three, the movie. <laughs> wow. That is it's, amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's, I'm wildly excited about it. Um, the, the footage is probably just going to be me bouncing around this park that we're going to film in, <laughs> like wow. Zebedee. But it just, yeah, it just feels like anything's possible. Um, anything's possible. And it's quite nice, you know, I, I sort of brought some um, issues that are still coming up to the group. But it was just, it's just nice to have that shared outrage and that shared kind of, right, this isn't right, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do there. Um, so yeah, it just it's just kind of opened a door of possibilities, um, I think, Amazing. massively. And if it goes wrong, I'll kill you all. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. It's kind words. Thank you. So um, you've talked about something and that's new to me. You've got the going down the video route. And I think that's a, an amazing idea. I think it's absolutely the right way for you uh, and your, your new business and your products. Um, but where else do you see your future going? Uh, you know, do you want to take this on a, on a global scale? Do you want to take this on a, you know, even do you want to partner with bigger brands? You know, where do you really see yourself in the next five years? Um, 
it's oh gosh it's quite difficult to what i'd yeah i'd like to see basically more more integrated things in the games so video um you know audio files that i'm gonna sort of um build in as well so just lots of different constantly sort of changing um the games but but yeah i want to i want to take it out of my house um you know my kitchen has got printers everywhere and my lounge has got trestle tables with boxes all over them that i'm going to be doing this afternoon um so next step is scaling up in terms of having somewhere else that i can take all this because certainly, you know, I can fit two people, two helpers in the lounge while I'm here in the kitchen doing stuff. It's not really practical going forward with the amount that I'm selling at the minute. So next stage is uh, rental of somewhere big that I can build the games. Then hopefully I can sort of take more of a step back to to be able to produce more and have, have more, you know, game three's been in my head the whole of this year, but I just haven't got round to putting it on paper. Um, but it's, it's happening now but that's kind of coincided with a massive massive spike in sales that happened last week so um, yeah I want to I need to have production to a level that those things can happen without knocking everything else sort of out of the ballpark um, and yeah I don't know I mean I, I've already I've already been chatting to somebody about licensing one of the, they've written a game um, I want to release it through me so potentially licensing Again, for them at the minute, uh, there's a bit of a uh, copywriting issues. I'm just making sure that all that's in place uh, for me before I start messing about with with anybody else. Um, so that's kind of on the back burner for the minute. But yeah, potentially, what I don't want to do is dilute my games because I like I've I've created a fake newspaper that's called Daily Retriever um, that I've named after my dogs, my Labradors. Um, I always have a, a fake pocket notebook in there that um, I like to create because then I leave blank spaces, I leave pages, just because that's how I always used to fill in my pocket notebook. I was always getting told off for it. Um, I was a devil for not filling bloody thing in and leaving big spaces thinking I'll go back. Yeah. Um, and the, the kind of introduction, the guiding hand through the whole thing is my brother-in-law. Um, so he's, he's, um, a character that's the detective agency that's given out these cases for people to go and try. So it's it's kind of, it's all a, a tribute to him um, to a degree. So it's all, it's all mega personal. So I don't want to take on anyone else's games if, if they're either gonna be rubbish or, you know, if they're unwilling to, God, I'm gonna sound like, I'm gonna sound like the people I hate. You do it my way or yeah. you're out. <laughs> I get it though, you're but, protecting your brand so you're not diluting it essentially. That's that's what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, basically. So yeah, I, I think certainly the next year, the next 12 months to 24 months, it's gonna be about getting the production to a level where I'm not on the back foot like I am sort of this week. Um, I'm always on the front foot and I've always got that time. Cause I, I, I um had a couple of helpers um come around to help me so the last couple of weeks i even i've sown a load of seeds in the greenhouse i thought to myself well i'll probably do the plants again because i enjoy it so much it will be on a, a much smaller scale but that'll be my kind of downtime hobby um and i've not been down to the greenhouse all week they're probably all dead <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> so essentially you want to create more leverage in your business work on it not so much in it so you can create new products, new creations that come out. Um, I think it's, I think it's a great, great way of going about things. Um, that's interesting. You mentioned your brother-in-law's in the game and obviously brother-in-law has passed away and it's kind of, you know, a great recognition for him, acknowledgement for him and his life. Um, I think that's an interesting point. You've, you've brought characters that you've created and also characters based on your inner circle into your games. Um, do you feel like that adds an element to the enjoyment of you know people buying your games because they're, they're characters essentially they can play people yeah gosh i hope so i hope so um because he was um just a really a, a really good fun really great laugh we just we used to do all sorts of stuff 
um, as a foursome. We'd go on holidays together all the time. And when he was getting ill, um, he'd come here for respite to give my sister a bit of a break. So he'd stay with me for a couple of weeks. Um, and he had a similar outlook as me in terms of just a general disdain for people. <laughs> so when I'm kind of writing the introduction, it's it's sort of, I, I'm imagining him saying it and, and, you know, it's a way of kind of keeping him alive to a degree and it, it holds my interest as well. Um, and I, I've started hiding little things among the games. Uh, some of my favourite films I, I reference throughout the game to see if anyone picks up on it. Um, I've created a legal firm, if there's any legal letters, called Legal Eagles, and it's signed Deborah Winger. <laughs> wow. And it just, it just, there's, so there's continuity through through all of it, and it's just, it's just funny little things that make me laugh. Um, so hopefully, hopefully people kind of pick up on that. It's not just something I've scratched, you know, scratched off the fridge and, and sent, sending out. It's really interesting. You've, you've, I mean, the story of Deborah, Deborah Winger, you've, you've, that's <laughs> something you went through when you was essentially, uh, you know, back in the day, right? And you've mm-hmm. actually brought that into the game now. And you've, it sounds to me, you've had these life experiences and you've powered this into the creation that, you know, you've got now, which is, I think it's just fascinating. It's really, really amazing. Um, cool. Okay. What would you say to someone Something I ask every single guest. Um, they're unhappy with the job, stressed, you know, not seeing the kids as much, trapped by the pension. They feel like they're literally in the job just to earn a, a wage. What would you say to someone who's wants to have this freedom and doing what they love and earn great money like you, but there's just that lack of maybe confidence holding them back, that, that lack of fear of the unknown that's holding them back? What would you say to that individual? Um, absolutely. Just do it. Just do it. I mean, certainly when I quit the police in terms of confidence and belief in my own abilities, I was, I was down in the, in the dirt, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't see my way clear, but I knew that if I didn't leave the police, that I would never see a path that it wouldn't happen. I would continue to be sort of beaten down and downtrodden and, you know, then become as negative as some of the other people that you just you know I I sat down and I worked out literally to the penny what my monthly bills were so what if I was absolutely desperate what I was going to have to scrape in a month um to earn and if you want to make money you'll make money there are so many ways to make money um you know like I did with the plants and even silly things like People, you, if you start talking to people, if you get yourself into a position where you're talking to more people, you start to know what the common problems are. And one of my kind of ideas, um, if the game hadn't worked, was everyone whinges and whines about not being able to get a window cleaner. So I thought, I'll get a gang of, of boys um, and basically, like, leaflet, we're window cleaning tomorrow. Do you want us to clean your bloody windows? Mm-hmm. Um, and literally drive around doing that with a, you know, get a roof rack and ladders on my car. Um, and, you know, things, organising things, just getting a group together and just organising stuff. There's, there's money to be made. It might not be the job that you want. You know, I don't want to wash windows. I certainly am not good at uh, climbing to heights as, as my fall from the bloody scaffolding proves. <laughs> I'm not a good climber, but it, it, if you just do something different, you know, I went from being a detective to literally months later, standing in a pub car park selling plants. And it was the best time of my life because people were buying them, <laughs> which was pretty amazing. Um, but also just the freedom, that weight off my shoulders, just that I don't have to do that anymore. I, and um, the money I'm earning now, this is fine. I'm going to be fine for now. Um, just do it. Because if you don't feel the fear of, oh, my God, what am I going to do? You're never going to know the sort of joy of, oh, actually, it's all right. Um, you know, that kind of it's a noose. It's, it's a lifeline and it's a noose having having a job that you hate it's it pays your bills but nothing else it just sucks your soul away so do it is the long answer <laughs> just do it. do it do it do it you can very, always go very... <laughs> it's true you can always go back very inspirational um so one of the last questions i like to ask everyone who joins uh, the podcast as a guest is uh for you catherine 
what does entrepreneurship mean to you? Um, really, it means not having to answer to anybody else, not having to be told what to do by people that I don't have any respect for um, and that know less than me, just freedom. I mean, I'm, I am working like crazy, but I'm doing it for me. Nobody else, no one else is going to take the credit for what I'm doing, just me. Um, and if I want a day off, I haven't had one this year yet. But if I want a day off, I'll, ha I'll have one. I don't have to ask anyone, I don't have to beg, I don't have to feel like I owe anyone anything. It's freedom, it's complete freedom. Absolutely word. amazing, absolutely.